Hi, this is Matt McCormick. I'm in the Department of Philosophy at California State University, Sacramento, and this is my first of probably two or three lectures on Robert Sparrow's article, Robots, Rape, and Representation. Uh, this is for my Philosophy of Artificial Intelligence course. Okay, so let's... Um, Sparrow's got a really interesting article here, and he comes to some pretty counterintuitive conclusions maybe for you in some ways and it's really important to sort of get clear on several distinctions and I'm going to make some distinctions that he doesn't make and I'm also going to um, represent some objections that he doesn't consider in the article so let's lift some of the highlights out of the abstract and sort of try to keep really crystal clear on what he's arguing for okay so first off he's arguing that the design of realistic female robots that could explicitly refuse consent to sex in order to facilitate rape fantasies would be unethical. Okay, so there's a lot to be said about all of that. Um, we're talking about non-sentient uh, robots. So not robots that have feelings or that have higher cognitive faculties that would warrant they're having moral status, like in a Schweitzgebel and Garza or Bostrom and Yukowski sense. These are robots that don't feel anything, but they act like they do, and they act like they're refusing consent. They act like they're being raped. So he's arguing that the design of robots, non sentient robots, that uh, behave or act like they're being raped is wrong. The design is wrong. Interestingly, we've got to think about whether or not engaging in such an activity itself would be wrong because that probably has a very high ick factor for lots of people and seems like there's got to be something wrong with that. And insofar as he argues that actually it is a kind of rape, you'd think that he would argue that just doing it, that raping robots is wrong, like there's an argument that would be interesting. Um, but Sparrow's not actually giving the argument that raping robots is wrong. He's arguing that designing um, rapeable robots is wrong. Why? Uh, several reasons, or at least let me, I don't know how to separate or parse this up, but I'm going to number these so we can talk about them. So first off, and this will be really important and interesting later in the argument, is that sex with robots in these circumstances is a representation of the rape of a woman. Okay, so it's something sort of intrinsic about what the act um, represents. That's what's wrong about the designing of them. And then he considers, but more or less rejects an argument that building robots like that would increase rape rates. So that's why it's wrong to design them. But he ends up interestingly arguing that most people want, he's convinced, but most people won't be convinced by his argument or the standard argument for number two. Uh, doing so, designing such robots um, is unethical because it expresses disrespect for women and it demonstrates a significant character defect. So this way he represents it all in the abstract. Um, furthermore, the design of robots that can explicitly refuse consent is problematic due to the likelihood that some users will experiment with raping them. So in virtue of the fact that somebody would go off and use it that way, then designing such a thing is wrong. Designing robots that lack the capacity to explicit refuse consent may be morally problem may be morally problematic, depending on which of the two accounts of representational content of sex with realistic humanoid robots is correct. Okay, so that's a complicated and technical distinction you can make later, and has to do with uh, what I've labeled as number one, reason number one here. Okay, so let's talk about some distinctions, um, and first off, some questions. Um, I've already sort of hinted at this. So would it be wrong to rape a robot, even a non-sentient one? And is it wrong to design a robot meant to be raped, or even simply that admits of being raped? Um, which of these is Sparrow interested in? I think it's the latter mostly. Now the first comes up, and it's certainly we're thinking about it, but it's mostly the latter that he's arguing for, and yes, he thinks it is. Uh, what would be the difference uh, between those two? There are different actions. So. Designing is something that programmers, that mechanical engineers, that electrical engineers, you know, that, that, the, that the sex toy or sex robot manufacturer would engage in. That's something they'd do. The action is something that the consumer would do. 
So can a robot even be raped is a legitimate question to ask here. We might argue that, that, that the word is not being uh, fittingly or appropriately applied in the circumstance. And we'll look and see how, how Sparrow deals with that. Can a robot simulate being raped, but it's not actually rape? That seems pretty obvious that it could. Um, wouldn't be that hard to build one that acts like it's being raped. It's you know, engaging in the simulation. I mean, we've already got these examples. Grand Theft Auto is not a, it's not a robot. It's a it's a simulation. It's a game, video game. But there's um, I don't know that there's possible to do simulated rapes in there. But there's certainly possible to do simulated murders in there. Is participating or creating simulations of immoral acts themselves is that immoral in some regard? Uh, and if it is, then all of us who are playing violent video games are uh, perhaps at um, making a mistake, uh, uh, depending on how we answer that question. Okay, so some distinctions. Let's get clear on what without consent means. There's a couple ways that can happen. So one is somebody can explicitly deny consent. So saying or otherwise indicating, saying no, uh, that a person does not want to have sex, where there's an awareness that sex or rape is a possibility, that's explicit denial of consent. There's also the lack or failure of consent. The person has not said or indicated that he or she consents. This is, um, you know, the, the, the absent consent. So there's a failure to consent if the victim's unconscious or drugged or drunk or otherwise incapable of responding. Um, so lack of consent in, that, in the, that case includes explicit denial of consent. That is, um, in the case where somebody explicitly denies consent, they are lacking consent. That is, there is a lack of consent if the person explicitly says no, and there's a lack of consent if a person isn't capable of giving or denying consent. Um, in humans, both of those are rape. So if someone were to go ahead and have sex with somebody when they explicitly deny it, that's rape. If someone um, has sex with someone who has failed to give consent because they're unconscious or drugged or drunk or whatever, um, those are both cases of rape. So question. Could sex with a robot that isn't capable of giving consent? Now, you should be reflecting right now on the difference between what that might mean, isn't capable of giving consent, um, in that case, and what it means in the lack of consent case above, where a human is now, is say, drunk too much um, and is unconscious. That's a person who's incapable of giving consent. Um, so could sex with a robot that isn't capable of giving consent or simulating consent because it's not built to consent be rape or a simulation of rape? So there's a lot of sort of important distinctions here that we gotta got to bring out. Okay, now let me make this distinction a bit sharper than Sparrow makes it. We need to make a distinction between sentient and non-sentient robots. Having sex with a sentient robot without consent could be actual rape for the same reasons it is with humans. So imagine we have, at some stage in the future, 40, 50, 100 years out, we've got robots that can feel, that can feel pain, that can feel pleasure, or they've got, so call that sentience. Following with uh, Bostrom and Yukowski, we could call sapience, is the capacity to have higher uh, cognitive reasoning faculties. So we can imagine that some robots in the near future could have both sentience and sapience. And um, for one of those machines that were someone to uh, forcibly have sex on that when that robot chooses not to or doesn't want it and it does similar sorts of harm, then that would just be rape. Um, now, we might consider some side arguments that such a thing's not, but... Um, Sparrow's actually not that interested in those kinds of cases. Those aren't as important. He's arguing for the more interesting and more challenging case where um, they're not sentient. So having sex with a non-sentient robot that simulates rape could be a representation of rape or not, depending on what the representation on what representation means in this context. Okay, so representations of rape may or may not be wrong depending on the relationship between the representations and the immoral acts. Like consider. Uh, some representations of rape, such as in a rape awareness training video intended to prevent rape, are not morally wrong. So there's a case where actors, for instance, are acting out a rape, and the goal here is to achieve a heightened awareness and to prevent a rape. So that's a representation of rape that's not itself morally wrong. Some representations of rape, says Sparrow, such as simulated rape and pornography that's intended to generate sexual excitement about rape, endorse rape, or advocate rape, that's morally wrong. So Sparrow's view is 
uh, that he, he gives some sort of arguments um, that those kinds of uh, representations are in fact wrong. So he's going to argue that um, certain kinds of simulated uh, rape with a robot um, fall into that kind of category. So um, if it's wrong to design or generate or simulate rape in pornography in those kinds of contexts such that it generates, uh, the goal is to generate sexual excitement, endorse rape or advocate rape. If you think those cases are wrong, he's going to say that building a rape robot to serve a similar sort of function and that it plays a similar kind of representational role in context, in society, the social, sexual um, and psychological role plays a similar kind of uh, um, function, then it's wrong in that case too. Uh, okay, so his thesis then, again, just to keep real sharp on it, is that the design of realistic female robots that could explicitly refuse consent to sex in order to facilitate rape fantasies would be unethical. So the design is unethical because sex with robots in these circumstances is a representation of the rape of a woman, uh, similar to the way it is in the kind of in the pornography case, which may increase the rate of rape. So one of the arguments there is that's going to add on is that he thinks having those things would make more rapes happen, more real rapes happen with humans, expresses disrespect for women and demonstrates a significant character defect. The designing of such robots is also morally prob problematic because some users will experiment with raping them, and that's a bad consequence that reflects back on um, the design and makes the design itself wrong. If sex with a robot that fails to explicitly consent is a representation of rape, then the design of such robots will most likely be morally wrong for the same reasons. Okay, so let me make another distinction here that Sparrow kind of uh, shifts back and forth on, and I want to make it really sharp. Okay, so I'm going to call this broad, uh, incapable of consent. So an object does not have the cognitive, emotional, sentient, or sapient faculties that make it a moral person, endow it with choice, and enable it to either consent or refuse with regard to its use. So there's a kind of trivial way in which, uh, you know, using a sex toy like a dildo or an artificial vagina or something is incapable of consent in this sense, right? It's just a, it's just a toy. It's just a piece of silicon. So we do no wrong by using it without consent. There's no consent in that, in that circumstance. Um, so that thing's incapable of consent, but we're not doing anything wrong um, by using it in that kind of case. However, that should be made distinct from this kind of uh, case where someone's incapable of consent, more narrow, uh, being like um, this is the case where we talked about, say, a woman um, drinks too much at a party, she passes out, and somebody has sex with her. Okay, she's incapable of consent in a narrow sense. That is, we think temporarily um, she can't consent, That, but were she to be sober, or were she to be conscious, or uh, were she to reflect on it or whatever, in some broader sense, in broader way, um, she would she would not consent. She would say no. So um, uh, in the class of cases where the the thing and the the object in question is a person who has the cognitive, emotional, sentient, or sapient faculties that make it a moral person, like that woman at a party does, but she's temporarily unable to consent or refuse, or even perhaps permanently. So we do think of cases where somebody is, say, in a hospital um, in a persistent vegetative state, and we're someone to force sex on that person. Uh, we treat that as rape, um, and that's a violation of consent, and it's different than if someone is using a sex toy. Or um, imagine someone's uh, paralyzed. So suppose somebody's in a quadriplegic state, um, and they can't um, uh, express themselves or can't communicate what they want or what they don't want. Um, we would consider that to be someone who's incapable of consent, yet um, that would be a violation. So the broad cases, those are not violations. Um, my use of broad and narrow here is probably, probably more confusing, but I just want to distinguish the, these two different kinds of incapable of consent. Um, so what happens now is sex acts that look like rape with a non-sentient robot, um, those at the outset, um, that's just simulated rape or quote-unquote rape. So let's just call it that. We think of that as simulated rape at the outset. And what happens is Sparrow wants to argue that it actually is rape. 
that somehow that kind of act, because the object that you're doing it with is woman shaped and woman acting and um, and discontent acting, uh, its behavior because of the social and sexual and the and the psychological context that that is not just simulated rape, it's actually rape. And I, for me, I think this is probably the most contentious claim and the most difficult claim to sort of understand the argument for, because I think I don't agree with um, this move in his argument. Furthermore, sex with a non-sentient robot that fails to explicitly indicate consent but does not simulate resisting or refusing consent like a real doll. So you may have seen these. I got some pictures of them here in the in the slides. So this is like a, a sort of big um, mannequin. Um, it's a mannequin that you can have uh, sex with, or strictly speaking, he says you could somebody could masturbate with it, right? So uh, that act um, is as much rape as the refusing consent scenario, like where somebody is unconscious and somebody has sex with them. So he actually thinks that that's actually uh, rape as well and wrong. Those kinds of cases are wrong. Sex with these sex dolls simulates or represents sex with women who are unconscious or drugged. Um, in virtue of the fact that they're just like they don't they don't have any behavior they just you know lay there at they're just they're just mannequins right okay so sex with a real doll then um, uh, understood a certain way from Sparrow's perspective is a sort of rape there are some counterintuitive implications from sex acts without the explicit consent of the sex bot are rape he admits. Um, one would think that we don't rape a dildo or artificial vagina, he says. We don't commit rape in fantasies where there's no explicit consent, um, just by you know having the fantasy in your mind. But Sparrow argues what a symbol or action represents depends on how members of relevant community of the relevant community will understand and interpret the action, rather than on the intentions of the author or actor. So this is this acts becoming rape or being rape is uh, is a public fact. It's connected to um, the the relevant community who's affected by it, women, and that's what makes it rape. Um, it's not the fact that uh, it's it's sort of irrelevant that those things are just sort of um, sex doll mannequins. Okay, so a preliminary objection here I've already hinted at that we got to think about. I want you to sort of wonder about to what extent does he handle this. Look, uh, if simulated rape is actually rape because of the affected community, then perhaps simulated murder, simulated theft, simulated torture are murder, theft, and torture by the same argument. Um, that is, I've got pictures of video games here. The one on the right's Grand Theft Auto. That guy's um, pulling the other guy's teeth out with pliers. And the guy on the left is just committing a murder. Maybe it's a justified war murder because they're engaged in a military act. But, um, you know, just imagine a gratuitous act of violence in a video game, a simulated gratuitous act of violence. So, um, Sparrow's in danger of having this argument, sort of this objection thrown at him. But look, if you think simulated rape is actually rape, then we should say the same thing for murder, theft, and torture. Uh, but obviously, simulated murder, theft, and torture are not real murder, theft, and torture. So the move is mistaken. So we should conclude that simulated rape is not rape. All right, so um, Sparrow needs to get around this objection somehow or other. Okay, so let me get my notes up here. Um... So that leads us then to, uh, we're going to return to the question of representation and try to suss out um, how it is he thinks that the representation becomes the thing. And that's coming in later sections of the paper. But he also says um, earlier that um, he makes, it gives us laundry list. I think it's my number one in the earlier slide. He gives us laundry list of other things it does. So one of the things he thinks um, that supports the argument is that simulating rape of this sort is going to make real rape more likely. So he thinks it's going to cause more rapes. So in effect, um, he argues that raping robots will make some people more likely to rape women. Um, and if some people are made more likely to rape women, then it will elevate the number of women who are raped. Let's see, I'll bump this out. And... Therefore, the practice of the rape of robots will cause some women to be raped. Okay, so that's worth thinking about one step at a time. 
Um, is premise one true? Raping robots will make some people more likely to rape women. And is premise two true? If some people are made more likely to rape women, then elevate the number of women who are raped. Um, maybe not as contentious as one. And therefore, the practice of the rape of robots will cause some women to be raped. So that argument is not real tight. It's not strictly valid. Um, the language in three doesn't follow the language in one. There's no mention of practice in one. But the idea is that um, were we to design robots that would allow this kind of simulated rape, is that more women get raped. Or it will cause some women to be raped, which is, that's different, sorry. So that's a different claim than the argument that more women will be raped. All right, so let's consider um, a parallel argument to get you thinking about the issues that are relevant here. Uh, we know, in fact, that this is true. Watching football will make some people more likely to assault women. There's a number of studies that demonstrate that on, um, on big football days, football game days, uh, men are more likely to, uh, uh, there's more domestic abuse cases. They uh, assault their wives or their girlfriends, especially, get this, um, if your team loses, uh, there's like a 10% spike in the calls and reports and cases of domestic abuse. So it's really quite stark, quite traumatic. Um, so we know that football will make some people more likely to assault women. It's not just a sort of correlation. There's actually some causal um, causal mechanism going on there. If some people are made more likely to assault women, then it will elevate the number of women who are assaulted. Therefore, the practice of watching football will cause some women to be assaulted. And we know that's true. That's actually uh, a, that's actually for real. So, what do we make of Sparrow's argument and this argument? Does this show that watching football is wrong? Most people are going to protest that. Or maybe this shows that neither one are wrong. Maybe this shows that watching football and simulating rape or engaging in simulated rape or whatever are not wrong. So notice that we're now considering about the claim is that someone's engaging in one of these simulated rapes with a robot is um, generating this moral wrongness that then tracks back onto the designer. So ultimately, the conclusion is going to be that the design of these robots is wrong, and it's because of these effects that come way downstream. Uh, okay, so <clears throat> I want you to think about that. In what ways are, are football alike or, or, or dislike, unlike the case we're considering? Um, and surely this is, sounds crass, but maybe we shouldn't, but we do accept some levels of increase. I mean, I, I, I gather, I don't know if, if, I don't know what sort of defense somebody might make of this, but I gather that people, uh, at least by their actions, implicitly seem to be demonstrating that while there is this increase in domestic violence against women as a result of watching football, we think of the overall benefits of watching football, the overall utility as being worth it. Um, I don't know whether, I'm not endorsing that argument, but I mean, think about it this way. Um, we think that a certain level of um, deaths, highway deaths, are acceptable. That if... Um, we all actually do engage in a kind of calculus here whereby um, we exchange speed limits for some level of safety. Now, if we wanted to have um, uh, our death rates, our, our um, accident rates, and people dying in highway, um, highway collisions to be zero, to be nil, we could you know, mandate 10 mile per, um, 10 mile per hour uh, speed limits on interstate highways. Uh, but we don't. And for every 10 mile per hour increase in the speed limit, there is a commensurate increase in the number of highway deaths per year. So we get like 40,000 highway deaths per year as a result of our having our speed limits at 55 and 65. Uh, we accept that implicitly, explicitly, we take that on. And we know that were we to raise the speed limits higher, we'd get more deaths and we lower them, we get fewer deaths. So we also know that were we to watch less football or um, engage in some other activities or do something else that we would reduce uh, domestic assault. So maybe it's one of these trade-offs that we all find acceptable that's sort of similar. So it's curious here, interesting to think about how Sparrow might deal with that argument with regard to um, the alleged increase in rape that simulated participating in simulated rape might cause. 
So now Sparrow actually acknowledges that this argument is not very good. He finds it strange. He finds it compelling, but he says that it's not a very good argument. So premise one says um, he acknowledges that exposure to or enjoyment of representations of an activity makes people more likely to engage in that activity is heavily contested. Um, remember, our first premise was that um, uh, that uh, the simulation itself will lead to more of the actual thing. And he acknowledges some of that video game research here that seems to be really mixed and doesn't show a clear any clear support for it, for that claim. Um, the opposite has been argued about um, simulated activities, like simulated violence, simulated rape, and the like. The opposite has been argued, and they call it catharsis. If this are, and the idea is that by allowing people to simulate violence, like in Grand Theft Auto, or simulate rape, it actually acts as a kind of... Um, um, uh, pressure valve, that it relieves pressure and leads to the lower rates of people being raped or murdered or what have you. So there's a sort of ongoing argument about the effect of violent video games and whether it, on the whole, it does more good or more harm. Um, I think what he's arguing here is that some people will go out and uh, be, that, that simulated rape will lead to some people's being raped. And the question is, well, maybe more people are actually being led to not rape. So some people will go out and commit rape where they wouldn't have, but allowing the thing may, on the whole, um, lead to more people not. So we get a net loss or something. I don't know. It's hard to do sort of controlled studies here. So if this argument is right, then a much wider range of other activities are also wrong, like uh, video games. Um, Sparrow likes the argument, but he but most people are unconvinced. It could be that raping robots makes some people more likely and some people less likely. So it could be that there's a net gain there um, overall. And furthermore, the argument I want to make here is that merely elevating harm, and this sounds really callous, but I think the football example makes this really clear, that look, merely, maybe even less controversial, uh, the highway speed limit case makes clear the mere fact that something elevates harm isn't enough to conclude that the activity is therefore wrong. So there's more work to be done, especially here with regard to my three that Sparrow doesn't really talk about. And he gives up on this argument. So he moves on and uh, uh, it shifts the burden of argument to the other sections of the paper. Okay, so... Um, a couple of other ideas and things to think about before we wrap up this uh, before we wrap up this first version first part of the lecture. Um, how about this? Just think through these options. Suppose a manufacturer builds a robot that simulates in high detail being a murder victim. Um, you can get one made up to represent your boss or Donald Trump or black people or Christians or women or whoever. And then you can murder it. You can murder it over and over again. Costs a lot of money, highly realistic, very detailed, acts very much like it's being murdered. It bleeds, it screams, it does all the things you want your murder victim to do. Okay, question. Would having access to something like that increase the probability of your committing real murder? Now, it's an empirical question about whether the widespread availability of those sorts of things would lead to more real murders. I'm just asking about you. How would, would that make you more likely to commit real mur murder? I'm not sure I could even do it. I don't know what it would do to me with regard to more likely to kill a real person. It doesn't seem to me that playing violent video games makes me more likely to kill real people. But the distinction between simulated there and the real world is very clear. And I think things change. And the reason I'm using Westworld uh, images here is that Westworld's a place full of highly realistic humanoid robots. They act, talk, and, and do all the things that humans do. And maybe something different happens to us when that happens. Now, I, I guess I wouldn't deny the claim that we're a highly realistic murder bot or victim bot be available and be, lots and lots of people could have them. There's some people out there that were they able to do that, um, it would lead to some increased likelihood that they'd actually go out and do it. I think there'd be some people who go out and actually do the real thing. As a result, as a causal, there'd be a causal contribution from the, the victim bot 
um, exercise that would contribute to their doing the real thing, whereas they might not have otherwise. Um, overall, it might be that the availability of something like that actually leads um, some of the people who would have gone out and committed real murder to do a simulated murder on their murder bot, and they feel better, get it out of their system, and now they don't have to murder their boss or Donald Trump or a black person or whoever. So in the big picture, there's an empirical question about whether or not the overall rates would go up. Um, I think some people would might be caused to, uh, you know, causes a complicated thing here, but they might be contributed to do be more likely to actually go do it, and some people be contributed to to be less likely to go do it. Um, so, would that represent murder is a good question to ask and think about in terms of Sparrow's argument because he says that certain kinds of representations, because of the way they fit into the social context, actually become. You know, he's going to argue that simulated rape is rape because of what it means to the population that's getting um, uh, represented here. So maybe a, a better a way to make it make the analogy really tight is um, imagine that you have a bunch of racist consumers of my victim bot example, and they uh, get on the website and they order up a highly realistic um, African-American victim bot, and then they bring that home, and then they kill that. So now you've got a population of real people, African-Americans, who um, maybe by analogy, Sparrow would argue, that because of what it represents to them, that takes on a special kind of moral status. Seems a little hard to call it murder, it still seems like simulated murder to me, but you can imagine how a population of African Americans would feel about people's doing that and how menacing or threatening or scary um, that would feel to them. Um, now, again, I'm not sure that it amounts to murder the way Sparrow wants to say that simulated rape is rape, but I think we've got a pretty strong case for there being something at least very icky going on here and something, you know, something deeply suspicious. I mean, he's going to argue that there's a character flaw that's manifest by it. And I can't imagine that some, well, I, I just don't know. It's an interesting empirical question, right? Um, what would a bunch of rabid, uh, you know, Ku Klux Klan type white nationalist, white supremacist characters who got a hold of those, what would be the net result of their being able to do that? Would they be perhaps um, as a result of engaging in their simulated racist murder, uh, be made more or less likely to do it. Maybe it'd make them better. Really uh, important open question here that we that we need an answer to to sort of sort out some of the details of Sparrow's argument. Um, so, so a question, would you try it if they let you? Would you do it in private? Would you even engage in something like that? Would it be wrong in virtue of its representing murder? It seems like there's something wrong about it. I don't know if it is murder, but it seems like there's something wrong about it, especially for um, the black people or imagine, you know, Jews protesting that someone's got a, um, a victim bot that's a Jew and they're killing it uh, for racist motivations or whatever. Or women um, does. Here's a question for Sparrow. Uh, does this argument um, work in parallel with regard to murder of women? So imagine that. Um, our domestic abusing football fans who get all amped up after watching um, their football games on Sunday and their team loses, um, they order up a victim bot uh, girlfriend that they can beat and kill uh, after the football game. All right, so that's got some pretty profound and pretty strong sort of, that's going to give you some pretty strong intuitions here about it's being wrong. Is it real? Is it murder? Again, Sparrow's trying to argue from simulated rape is rape. So that's simulated murder. Is it murder? It's not, it's not look, it, it, it's definitely murder if he murders his real girlfriend. It's simulated murder if he r murders his victim bot. And it's bad, but maybe Sparrow needs, and again, this is me sort of offering my ideas here, maybe Sparrow needs a category to talk about the wrongness of that kind of special act that's in between, you know, a, sim, a simulated game murder and a, um, a humanoid, a, a robot, a highly realistic robot murder, and we need to, a way to talk about that wrongness that doesn't call it murder. Um, but he wants to call the real thing, call the simulated rape rape. 
Would it erode your virtue? It seems like it can't be good for you to be doing stuff like that. Seems like. But I, I'm reluctant to draw sort of sweeping conclusions here on the basis of my intuitions. I'm not sure what it would do to people. I'm not sure what it would do to me. Um, okay, so what's the moral harm principle here that is being invoked that might lead us to generalize or draw a conclusion about what's going on? Look, we don't want to say, uh, or in what, under what circumstances, if there's some elevated harm that comes from a new activity, then it is therefore morally objectionable or should be opposed. Like, um, look, it's not enough to just point out that something leads to more harm. Uh, because we accept varying levels of harm um, for all kinds of activities, right? And there's trade-offs all the time. So it can't be that the principle that, and Sparrow's not endorsing this, so it can't be that the principle is that no increases in risk are acceptable at all. Uh, we all engage in all kinds of activities that have uh, risk levels with them, like watching football, and it can't just be that any increase, that if it leads to any increase, then that's... Um, we have to reject it or that makes it wrong increases in risk are only acceptable perhaps if there is some other overarching mitigating or justifying benefit although it's kind of hard to say that about football do we think that the overall utility of foot watching football or playing video games is higher than the disutility that it leads to um i don't know what to think about the football case clearly people accept the trade-off um they you know but maybe they should. Um, I, I have a hard time sort of defending football here. Uh, but pretty clearly, it's contributing to domestic violence. Um, so, but we would think perhaps, maybe this is just rationalizing, just trying to construct an argument in favor of something we like doing. So I won't try to defend football on the case. Um, it, it would be unreasonable to adopt something they call the precautionary principle that says no increase in risk is acceptable. That can't be right because our lives are full of all kinds of risks. There's never a case where we're engaged in any activity that has no increase, no risk associated with it. Um, it might be that 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 um, from a regulatory perspective, we might have a policy that says the burden of proof that activity X is safe is on those who would enable or pursue it. So maybe the, you know, the government or maybe regulatory agencies would demand of um, the manufacturers that they provide proof that it's safe. Uh, but again, safety has to be cashed out in terms of probability. So I'm not sure what um, principle um, Sparrow can defend here. So again, um, Sparrow admits, and here's where we were. So we're arguing for the conclusion that the design of highly realistic female robots, non-sentient ones, that could explicitly refuse consent to sex, uh, that is ones that simulate being raped, in order to facilitate rape fantasies would be unethical. Okay, so design, designing these things is unethical because it's the because that kind of sex with robots is a representation of rape, and it's wrong for similar reasons to why um, pornography rape is wrong, according to Sparrow. And we have to have yet to get to some of those arguments. Um, he says it may increase the rate of rape. And I've raised a lot of questions about that. I'm not clear on the grounds for that. And he seems to acknowledge that um, that's that there's his arguments for that that uh, number two are not compelling. It expresses disrespect for women. This is an argument that's coming, and it demonstrates a significant char character defect. So we're going to look at three and four in subsequent lectures. We just looked at the argument in um, uh, let's see. We just looked at the argument for. Two, not one. My slide is wrong there. But it's not compelling, and Sparrow admits that.